So before we get started with uh, Ginny's presentation, um, which I'm uh, again really excited about to, to hear about researching and how we can promote DEI uh, principles and ideas when it comes to our academic research. Um, I did want to hand it over to Celeste uh, Williams, if you want to share a little bit about um, what the DEI student group has been up to and how people can get involved. Oops, you're on mute. I am muted. Okay, yeah, there we there go. You go. <laughs> um, so, sorry, I keep opening up different windows. Here we go. Uh, so I'm a, a Miami U Project Jack and Fly AIP student since 2019. And I was drawn to this group because I was seeking camaraderie as a woman of color uh, in this program. And uh, it was very excited to be part of this and the different guests that have been invited so far. And we give a little background of Project Diverse Supply. So it is a cooperative of Project Dragonfly students, alumni, staff, and affiliates committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, both within the program itself and in the greater conservation and education fields. Project Diversify is dedicated to creating and fulfilling actionable steps towards a stronger, more diverse community at Miami University, supporting the voices of Black, Indigenous, and other persons of color, BIPOC, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer questioning, LGB, L, LGTBQ, and people li living with disabilities within the field of conservation. We hope to come together to confront topics like climate and environmental justice, colonialism and conservation, and the historical lack of diversity in the environmental field. We aim to enact a, mentor a mentor mentorship network of people of color and additional underrepresented groups and identities. And this space provides resources to foster the identification of issues within the conservation community and find meaningful solutions. And if you're interested in joining us, I'm gonna copy the link into the chat. Thank you all for being here. Thanks, Celeste. Um, so it's really cool how this group has uh, organically formed and uh, you know, if you help us get the word out about it and uh, for support and new ideas when it comes to um, diversifying conservation. Um, I think I just made a new verb. But um, so yeah, so so this is this is great. And I was so happy that um, we've actually had uh, two of these dragonfly cafes so far. Um, this is the third one. Um, and we have a few others uh, coming up in, in the summer. But this one is, uh, we're so happy to have Ginny Bame um, with us. Uh, she's on my screen, she's over there. Um, but she's gonna share a little bit about uh, research. And like I said, she is the science librarian for Miami University. She's also liaison to Project Dragonfly. So she's, oh, mentored and helped us with research for dozens, hundreds, I don't know how many students, Ginny, at this point. Um, so we really appreciate all you've done um, and sharing with us a little bit tonight. Um, so I will hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much for, for inviting me. Um, huge thank you to Kevin and to Karen for, for basically reaching out and be like, hey, can you, you wanna do this thing? And I was like, yes, I wanna do this thing. Let me do this thing. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen and make sure all of that is good to go. Um, okay. Um, I'll just add in, Ginny, that um, if anyone has questions throughout the presentation, this is the kind of like group and, and setup where we encourage you to uh, go ahead and, and use the chat and throw those in there and we'll try and get to them as we go. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, that's actually what I was trying to do um, while also not trying to, trying to not narrate what I was doing. I have a tendency to do that. Um, pulling up the chat window to make sure that I can see it. Um, so yes, please, as we go, feel free to throw in your questions. Um, I love, it's not, 
I call it being derailed, but it's not derailing at all. I love going off on tangents and I love talking about and expanding further on things. Um, so please don't hesitate to throw in your questions and we'll get them answered. And if I miss them, if we miss it as it goes by, then we'll come back to it um, at the end. All right, sound good? Cool. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much again for having me. Um, like Kevin said, I am a science librarian here at Miami University um, and the liaison to the Project Dragonfly program, um, in addition to several other in the life sciences. So all of you new students, all of you current students, um, all of you faculty who have not really seen my face much or encountered me much before, very likely you'll encounter me via email. Um, or virtual consultations, I highly, highly encourage you to reach out to me at any point um, after today during your program. If you want, if you need help finding research, if you want, um, want me to come in and teach part of your class, like teach your students how to do research, any of that stuff. If you have particular library research need, that's me. That's all me right here. Um, so I'll have my contact information at the end and I'll, I'll make sure these slides get shared out. Um, afterwards so you all can have have this as a resource um, but that being said there's a lot to cover so let's go ahead and get started um so i'm going to give a very brief personal background Jenny, myself. let me yes. sorry let me just jump in I we're seeing your uh your screen like saver your main screen not your um uh oh that's not yeah. right no that's okay you might need to i don't know um unshare your screen and then try it again yeah, yeah. okay that better? There it is. Yep. There it is. Okay. Let me make sure. All right. So this was the title slide in case you missed that title slide. Yay. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, give a brief personal intro for myself, my, my um, path up until this point, basically. And then we're going to talk about research life cycle and disparities in STEM as a result in some cases of that research life cycle. And then we're gonna hopefully have some time for discussions. We can talk about, you know, as a group, like how can we help begin to compensate? How can we overcome some of these challenges and some of these disparities? Um, now, I'm gonna go ahead and preface all of this by saying this is a super, super broad topic. It's huge. Um, I am only gonna be scratching the surface of a very, very small area of all of this. Um, so I'm going to talk mostly about the problem and then hopefully we can crowdsource where we start discussing some solutions. So that's um, if you all would please go ahead and make sure that you're muted. Um, just so we don't oh, 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 oh. Awesome. Um, Excuse me, what was your name? David. David and Emily. It did mute me, the mute, everyone did mute me, just FYI, but I got it, okay, we're good. Um, so I'm gonna also start by saying, um, making sure that we acknowledge that Miami University is on the lands um, of the Miami and Shawnee people. These lands were forcibly taken from them. Um, and I, I am of the opinion that land acknowledgements are, are great to have but they really need to have a call to action. They need to have some kind of actionable something. Otherwise they're largely performative. I don't wanna be performative. I want to have action. Um, so I highly encourage you to, if you are interested to check out some of these organizations. Um, I have a link down here to Charity Navigator. Please consider donating in support of um, a charity that's focused on supporting the rights of indigenous peoples or in a DEI focused charity. Um, if that is if that is what you choose to do, it is very much needed in a lot of these cases. Um, so on that very, very cheerful note, I guess. Um, me. So I have a bachelor's in biology from Birmingham Southern um, in Birmingham, Alabama, you guessed it. Um, when I graduated, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. So I took a job at BSC as a supervisor of the library students. And that's kind of what led me to get my master's in library and information science. 
Um, and I was very, very lucky. As soon as I graduated, I landed this job. So I've been here for almost four years now, um, working as a science librarian. Um, and I put this picture up to remind me to, to tell you guys, I apologize in advance. Um, this little guy is Dinsdale. He is the most intrusive feline I have ever encountered. Um, believe it or not, he's worse if I close the door. So I'm gonna go ahead and apologize if, if he interrupts us um, as he is as he is like to do. Um, so as a science librarian, um, you know, here at Miami, they're very similar. We have similar responsibilities to faculty. Um, and so we are responsible for conducting research and um, research in our field. And so some of my research interests include scholarly communication, like we're talking about right now, um, and also student research, right? Supporting student research, particularly supporting undergraduate student research. Um, I've been working with Steve Sullivan here at Miami. He's the director of the Na Hefner Museum of Natural History. We've been co-teaching a first year research experience course for a couple of years, and that's been very rewarding and very amazing. Um, and I'm also interested in cross-disciplinary partnerships and initiatives and um, you know, supporting, supporting humanities and science, um, their interrelationship, supporting the arts and sciences, their interrelationship, um, supporting DEI initiatives, things like that. Um, so pretty wide portfolio here. Um, but to my first point, my interest in scholarly communication is really what informs a lot of what I'm talking about today. So when we talk about the research life cycle, this is usually what kind of springs to mind, right? This very simple, ooh, I have an idea. I'm gonna think about this. I'm gonna plan an experiment for it. Okay, I'm gonna now discover, I'm gonna go look out and see um, what the literature says, like what supporting research is there about this thing? Okay, so I got some background information. I know what others have done. I'm going to design an experiment on my own. I'm gonna gather and analyze some data. And then, okay, I've gotten some data, I've got some interesting conclusions, I'm going to write about it, I'm going to publish about it, and then I'm going to share out that research, I'm going to disseminate that in some way, shape, or form, um, which is going to impact my career, right? And then, based on the conclusions of that data, based on my conversations with some, with some colleagues, I might start all over again. Ooh, those conclusions, I wonder if it's due to this other thing, let me think about that, let me plan something, and the cycle starts all over again. Right. This is the kind of uh, the kind of cycle that a lot of us get used to. A lot of us get get shown when we're in our programs, um, and I like it. But it is very very simplified. This is probably a closer approximation of of the actual research life cycle. Um, right. You start in the planning cycle with your, uh, you know, trying to find funding. How do you track down funding? Oh crap, we have to write grants now. Oh boy, um, you gotta write grants. We have to apply for grants. We have to bite our fingernails and hope we get one of those grants. And then, hey, we've secured funding, hurrah, hooray. Or uh, we didn't get that one. Let me try all over again in that one planning cycle. Um, when you finally get to exit that cycle, then you go on to your project management, right? You plan your experiment, you collect your data, you figure out how you're going to report this to the grants, to the funding agency. Are you compliant with the grant? Um, is your data okay? Like, are you collecting the right data? Are you storing it properly? Are you curating it properly? All of that stuff. Um, and then we finally get to the conclusions, we're like, okay, now we can start thinking about dissemination, um, writing the work. So. You attend writing workshops if you're not familiar with the writing part of it. Um, you get feedback on a presentation from some of your colleagues, right? You have all of this stuff that um, that is part of the writing process before it even goes up to being reviewed by other people, um, before other other researchers outside your little bubble, I should say. Um, then you get to peer review if you're if you're piece of work is going to be peer reviewed or editorially reviewed or just kind of glanced over before it gets published, right? Um, and then you can finally exit that part of the cycle. When you get to preserve, this is the, the sticking point for a lot of people, right? How do you preserve your, your research? How do you preserve your data? Um, in a lot of cases, the journal will, will, or if you're writing an article, I should say, the journal will preserve that work for you, but what about your data sets? What about the presentations that came before 
that article, right? What about the commentary that comes after that article? All of this stuff. Um, and then you also have, you know, your final report to the funding agency if you have if you have that to worry about. And then you can finally start to worry about, okay, what are other people going to think about this? Are they going to agree? What conversations are going to be pulled from this? Um, and then, then finally, we get started at the beginning again with our planning cycle. Ooh, I have a new idea. Oh crap, I need to find more funding for it. And we start all over. Um, however, even that complex cycle still doesn't really get the whole picture, right? I talked a little bit about it, but you know, research is not self-contained. It's like this, this particular cycle, it is focused on one piece of output, one experiment, one idea, right? Research doesn't exist in a vacuum. It is influenced by all of these other ideas, right? It's part of that larger scholarly conversation. And that, like I mentioned a little bit, it encompasses more than just research articles, right? There's conference presentations, there's conference proceedings, which are somehow different than conference presentations. There are journal articles, there are book chapters, there are entire books. There are letters and comments to journal articles and book chapters. There are corrections, there are retractions to all of these things. There are, there is social media, there is social outcry against or for um, social, social media support for a paper, right? All of these things influence the scholarly conversation. And in some cases, they're not as impactful, they're not as considered as much as other types of research, right? Twitter is a really, really big part of the scholarly research cycle these days. Who knew? Um, but if, you know, if something, if something blows up on Twitter, um, if someone doesn't like the way that you have said something or has, um, you know, has takes takes umbrage or disagrees with your methodology or something, then oftentimes they won't even do the traditional letter to the editor. They'll just say, I don't like this research on Twitter. Now people will kind of get annoyed with it or supportive of it. And it kind of goes down from there. But all of this needs to be taken into account when you're doing your research. Um, now, um, yeah, so here's here's an example that, um, that Kevin actually sent me a couple of days ago that I thought, ooh, that's a really, really good example. I'm gonna use that. Um, so this was a meta-analysis. This was a paper that was published um, in, I think the journal Science, it looks like a science headline. Um, after it was published, the authors realized they made a mistake. Um, I don't know if it was because of something they discovered on their own or someone pointed it out to them, but either way, they issued a correction to it. This is now part of the scholarly record for this article. It's now part of the scholarly conversation for this, um, for this topic. After the correction was posted, right, there's a comment submitted to the journal, right? I don't agree with what these researchers did, or we don't agree with what these researchers did. And then after that comment, there was a response to the comment, right? We respectfully disagree with your disagreement on our methods or on this paper, right? All of this should now be part of the scholarly conversation around this particular topic, right? So if you're doing research on this and you only cite um, the research from that first paper, you don't take the corrections into account, you don't take the comments into account, you don't take the rebuttal to the comments into account, then you're missing a good portion of, um, of the context. You're missing some of some additional information that could be relevant, that could be highly relevant to your research, to the argument that you're trying to make, to the conversation that you're adding to. So why is this important? Hopefully it's self-explanatory. The quality of this conversation depends very heavily on who is included in that conversation. And historically speaking, those people, not to denigrate the, um, the white males in this room, but historically speaking, it has been almost exclusively white males. And this is a problem, right? Because these are some retracted articles, some bad science that has been published, not exclusively by white males, but um, that 
perhaps has been influenced, heavily influenced by the conversation that was started by historically white males, right? Um, this retracted article basically came to the conclusion that obese people are more dishonest than lean people. Um, this article was questioning whether skin color affected aggression or sexuality, right? Are black people more aggressive? Are brown people more aggressive or sexual than white people? Um, how attractive really are women who have endometriosis? It's a really good question, isn't it? Hmm, yeah, I didn't think so. What's the association between the gender of an academic mentor and the career trajectory of their mentees? They basically came to the conclusion that female advisors, female mentors are bad for your career. So yeah, all of these, not great. Um, a lot of these not retracted for several years. Um, this, this bottom one, the association between early career mentorship um, that was published uh, in November of 2020, and that one got a huge outcry, or it was retracted. Yeah, published November 2020, um, got a huge outcry on Twitter. And because of that outcry, it was in, almost immediately corrected or, sorry, almost immediately retracted. Um, the attractiveness of women with endometriosis, that one was not, I don't think, recalled for about seven years. Um, so this is a problem. This is a huge problem in scientific publishing, right? How do we make sure that we're not publishing these, you know, bunk articles, this junk science? And, you know, I, obviously, it's, there's no easy fix to that. Even getting diverse um, publishing teams is not going to fix all of this, but... It can help. Um, so this is an excerpt from a paper. This is a figure that I pulled from a paper that was examining gender inequality on a historical level, right? So from in 1945, um, across all of these disciplines, the female authors were about 14% uh, of the total. That number had increased by 2005, but only to about a third. So women, I think, are, are 51% of the population, give or take. We are represented in one third of the scholarly articles in 2005. Um, and it gets even worse when you look at particular disciplines, right? I'm sure it's no surprise that math, physics, computer science, engineering, that ratio across all of those years is significantly lower than it is for you know, political science or psychology. Biology is not represented here um, specifically, but it would also be probably around somewhere between chemistry and political science, somewhere in the one third area. But still, that's not great, right? We're half the population. We should be getting half of the credit for this. We should be, rep be represented half of the time in academic publishing, and we're not. Um, this trend can also be seen uh, when looking at race in academic publishing. This paper was examining um, the applicants, they're examining the biosketches of applicants for um, NIH grant money. And what they found was that uh, for, particularly for Black and African American researchers, they had significantly fewer publications on the record. They had significantly fewer citations to those publications. They had fewer co-authors and they had a lower impact factor for all of their papers, all of their publications, and compared to Asian, Hispanic, and white authors. And obviously this is a problem, right? Because it's kind of like a self-fulfilling cycle. It's not kind of like, it is a self-fulfilling cycle, right? Productivity is linked to impact, right? When we are, when we as researchers are more productive in our research, we have a higher impact on the, scholar, the scholarly conversation, right? Our voices are heard more. That in turn influences our tenure and promotion prospects, right? If we can't, if we're not productive, if we're not impactful, we can't get tenure. If we don't get tenure, if we don't get promotion, we can't continue to be impactful and productive, right? And so we just start all the way at the beginning. 
And it's been found, it's been, it's generally agreed upon that having diverse author teams leads to better science, leads to better, um, better research being published, better research being conducted, right? So when we are not represented, and I say we to include all, include women, include other represented populations on gender lines, for racial lines, for sexual uh, sexuality, um, socioeconomically, all of this, when we are not represented, bad things happen, right? I'm not saying that we need to fully replace all the, um, the, those who have privilege, those who are, you know, traditionally speaking, historically speaking, white males, we need to work with them better. They need to work with us better. We need to increase the parity of, um, of our research, right? Increase the parity in productivity and research productivity in um, who's being cited, who's being given, you know, award, who's being awarded money for their research, all of these kinds of things. And as I'm sure is probably no surprise to you, the COVID pandemic did not do any of us any favors, right? I'm gonna read a couple of excerpts here. Um, Women have reduced their work hours more than men due to schooling and caregiving demands during the COVID pandemic, right? Women faculty members and those with children have been less likely to submit grant proposals and journal articles or to register new projects, right? Our productivity, our impact has tanked. Um, let me see. BIPOC faculty members are also more likely to be conducting community engaged research, which has also faced additional pandemic interruptions, right? With social distancing, distancing, community research can't really continue in the same form. They've had to either compensate or uh, scrap some of their work entirely. In addition, many women and faculty of color have also been on the front lines for and supporting vulnerable students with Black, Indigenous, and Latina women particularly burdened with mentoring and service work, right? It's the this, this sort of um, that emotional labor, that housework, the, the traditionally, traditionally um, female work that is being shoved onto us, right? Oh, you guys are more caregiving. You can, you can deal with the, the, the students while we go off and you know, do our research, while we do be productive and do all these things. Um, and it's very much up in the air whether or not we're gonna be able to rebound, whether um, the strides that we had made bef before the pandemic, whether the parity, well, approaching parity as close as we can, um, is going to recover after the pandemic or how long it's going to take before it recovers to pre-pandemic levels, right? All of this, huge problem. Okay, so what the hell can we do, right? Seriously, like what can we do? It's a really good question, I don't know. I think with very few exceptions here, all of us are on the front lines, right? We're not administrators, we're not policy makers, we don't have influence over a lot of that. We can't make decisions um, and be like, all right, I wanna award grants to these people, or we need to, you know, I want to make sure that there are policies in place to support flexible work environments for these people. Like we, we don't have the power, I don't have that power. I'm pre-tenure, I definitely don't have that power. So what can we do as ground level people, as, as, as beginning researchers? Well, there are a few things, right? We can intentionally seek out underrepresented scholars, um, I still recall a time when the conversation around diversity was sort of like, all right, we're colorblind. We don't see diversity. We accept everyone as they are. We are all equal. And that's backwards, right? If we want to try to achieve parity, we need to intentionally seek out underrepresented um, populations, underrepresented authors whose work we can use, right? We need to be intentional about that because otherwise, like as we have seen, it's not gonna happen without us, without us doing that. Um, so those of you who are students, those of you who are doing research, right? As you're looking at your literature, if you see if there's um, minority or female authors that you can cite, look outside the United States for funding agencies. And a lot of our databases at the libraries, you can search by funding agency um, and you can search by international funding agency. That is potentially a way to do it. Um, another way, which some of this research was based on and which is not ideal, but it's kind of what we're stuck with, 
is you can make approximations for, you can um, assume and then double check, but you can assume a little bit of, uh, of race, of femininity, of, I'm sorry, not femininity, but uh, gender based on names, right? Uh, some of this research was based on, all right, this one has a traditionally female, this author has a traditionally female name. This author has a traditionally Korean name, things like that. Um, again, it's not great, but that is the data that we have, and that is the data that you can work with. And then once you have some of those names you, that you seek out, you can verify, go on social media, find some underrepresented scholars, um, find some BIPOC scholars, find some female scholars who are, you know, researchers in your field, follow them. A lot of faculty, a lot of researchers will post about their work on Twitter or on other social media. You can easily find them. Um, if you find them, if you know their names, then you can look look for their scholarship in some databases, right? Um, let me see. Oh, there's a question. Many, most question mark, universities don't provide health insurance to untenured faculty. This is a problem for younger untenured females who want to have children. Don't you think that universities have a responsibility to take these actions to help attract female faculty? Yes, I do. Um, I don't know if it's that most universities don't provide health insurance to untenured. Um, untenured is kind of a um, kind of an in, I would say an incorrect word there. I mean, it is it is a correct word, but it doesn't quite get the whole picture. So there's pre tenure and there's um, non tenure track, right? So pre tenure typically full time um, pre tenure faculty do have health insurance. I sort of one of those, I have health insurance. Um, adjunct faculty, visiting faculty, very often do not. And that is a problem. Yes, that is a huge problem. Um, as long, along with all of the other lack of job security and lack of benefits that um, adjuncts and VAPs are awarded. Um, yeah, I fully agree that universities absolutely have a responsibility, um, but they are cheap which is the problem. Um, not that they are cheap, but that universities underpay them, I should say. Um, one, of my, one of my colleagues, uh, she's the arts and, uh, arts and humanities librarian here. She was, um, she was an ad, she calls it adjunct hell for years up in Akron, where basically she had to take adjunct roles at like four or five different institutions just to make ends meet because none of them paid enough. So yeah. That's a problem. Universities have a have a clear way to fix it, in my opinion. But yeah. So, if you're really passionate, if you agree that universities have responsibility, then contact the Senate representative for Project Dragonfly. Make your voice heard. Shared governance is a thing that that Miami has that a lot of universities have, and it can be effective. It can be effective. Whether or not it is often effective is a different question, but yeah, there are things that we can do and that we can encourage the university to do. Good question. Um, okay. Okay. Well, seek out underrepresented scholars, right? Hop on Twitter, hop on our databases, intentionally look for for scholars whose work you can cite who are not necessarily white, who are not necessarily male. Um, not to say that their research is bad, they are very overrepresented. For those of you who are, who are also doing research, intentionally seek out diverse teams, right? Reach out to colleagues, reach out to classmates, um, faculty members. If you're assigning group work, try to make those groups di as diverse as possible, right? Socioeconomically. Um, from a gender perspective, from a race, race perspective, from racially, um, any of these things. Try to find some, uh, try to make groups, try to um, find groups who's, who how, all have different backgrounds so you all can learn from each other, from, so they can learn from each other. I fully believe that a lot of those retracted papers would not have gotten to that point, would not have gotten to the publishing point if the people who have been writing them were part of diverse teams, if the people who were reviewing them, if the peer reviewer pool was more ethnically, racially, gen genderally, is that a word, uh, diverse, if those pools are more diverse, I, I fully believe that they would not have gotten as far as they did. Um, 
particularly for faculty, take a look at your at your reading list for your classes. Look at your syllabus. Is there a way you can diversify some of those some of those readings? Take a look at the textbook. Is, is there a textbook you've been using for years and you just keep using it because it's what you've always done? Um, there may be a better one. There may be if it's a if it's a published textbook, there may be a cheaper option, right? Look into open educational resources. Look into other types of um, other types of publications. So if you have a couple of textbooks, maybe look, but you only use like fifty percent of them. Maybe find some just freely available readings to use. Find some course packs. The libraries can help with that. Um, any of these things are options. And I think the biggest thing is don't be afraid to speak out. Speak out on Twitter. Speak out to your professor if that you think their reading lists are not diverse enough, if you think your group is not diverse enough, right? Um, speak out to your administrators. Don't be afraid to speak your mind if you see disparity, right? If, yeah, I, what, what's to elaborate on that one? Speak out, don't be afraid, don't be silent. That is, that's part of the, I think part of the vicious cycle, part of the worst parts is we see disparity, we see unfair things, and we are silent. We need to make our voices heard. And that's how we can affect change, right? Okay, homework, not really, this is not real homework, don't do this. Um, well, actually do it, but it's ungraded. Um, if you've written something recently, take a look at a paper, take a look at um, a book chapter, take a look at a presentation, something that you've done recently, something that you've read recently, take a look at the citation list. How diverse is it? Is it all white males? Is it all American authors? Um, are they all English speaking authors? Where can you improve? Are there other people that you can cite? Are there other um, other avenues, other funding agencies whose work you can you can look through. See what little steps, baby steps you can take that can possibly snowball on each other to affect bigger change in your work, in others' work, right? Okay. So like I said, <laughs> there's a lot that I could talk about for all of this. There are so many avenues that we can take. Um, there are just, there, there's so much, there's so much I could rant about, honestly, but I'm not going to subject you to all of that. Um, if you really, really want to hear me rant about things, you are welcome to contact me, set up an off, um, come visit me during office hours, uh, set up a virtual appointment, send me an email. I am more than happy to rant with you, rant around you, um, just discuss things with you, any of that stuff. I am more than happy to, but now, um, we got about 20 minutes left. So I want to, I want to hear from you all, right? I want to have sort of an open discussion. What problems have you all encountered? What other um, opportunities can we do? What other solutions can we possibly take to help um, to help start the work of increasing parity, um, increasing DEI? in STEM publishing or in scholarly, just scholarly research in general. Thanks so much, Jenny. I'm sure someone will come with a question, but maybe we'll just do a little, a little virtual clap. <laughs> Thank you for all that. And I, I do hope someone takes you up on the rant. Um, <laughs> want to hear more.